Marina by T.S. Eliot. Quis hic locus, quae regio, quae mundi plaga? What seas, what shores, what grey rocks and what islands, what water lapping the bow? Then scent of pine, and the wood thrush singing through the fog. What images return, O my daughter? Those who sharpen the tooth of the dog, meaning death. Those who glitter with the glory of the hummingbird, meaning death. Those who sit in the sty of contentment, meaning death. Those who suffer the ecstasy of the animals, meaning death, are become unsubstantial, reduced by a wind, a breath of pine, and a wood song fog, by this grace dissolved in place. What is this face, less clear and clearer? The pulse in the arm, less strong and stronger, given or lent? More distant than stars and nearer than the eye, whispers and small laughter between leaves and hurrying feet under sleep where all the waters meet. Bowsprit cracked with ice and paint cracked with heat. I made this. I have forgotten and remember. The rigging weak and the canvas rotten between one June and another September. Made this unknowing, half-conscious, unknown, my own. The garboard straight leaks, the seams need caulking. This form, this face, this life, living to live in a world of time beyond me. Let me resign my life for this life, my speech, for that unspoken. The awakened, lips parted, the hope, the new ships. What seas, what shores, what granite islands towards my timbers, and wood thrush calling through the fog, my daughter. T.S. Eliot was baptised into the Anglican Church on the 29th of June 1927. Marina was published in 1930. This is how Lyndall Gordon, Eliot's biographer, places Marina in the context of Eliot's life. In each successive poem, Eliot told his conversion story from the vantage point of a further stage as providence led him, he said. Irresolute, in the Hollow Men, 1923-25, ill at ease in the Old Dispensation in his first post-conversion poem, Journey of the Magi, August 1927, Waiting in Ash Wednesday, December 1927 to April 1930, and at length some quickening sense of attainment in Marina, July to September 1930. That's Gordon, page 243. Marina is a monologue spoken by a man who has lived through a period of intense suffering and hardship. His boat bears witness to the nature and intensity of his suffering in the course of his travels. Bowsprit cracked with ice and paint cracked with heat. The rigging weak and the canvas rotten. The garboard straight leaks, the seams need corking. The poem is made up of images and narrative fragments, interlinked by patterns of association and sound, rather than by a linear narrative or logical connections. The images have to do with the speaker's past, his present location and his possible future. So crystallising Eliot's abiding preoccupation with time past, time present, and time future. The speaker's mind moves from one, <coughs> from one image to another and back again, as if musing or ruminating. The rhythms and metre range according to subject matter and mood, 
between formal poetic metre, incantation, and lines of different length to capture the less regular rhythms of everyday speech. I see Marina as a poem of two parts, followed by three concluding lines, which take us, which take us back to the beginning of the poem. Each of the two parts is introduced by a question or a series of questions, moves through a sequence of images and ends with a response to the questions with which it began. The questions in the first paragraph about the location are answered in the line, by this grace dissolved in place. The questions which begin the second part find a response in the final paragraph. Given that the last three lines are largely a repetition, but with differences, of the questions with which the poem begins, the poem as a whole appears to have a circular or a spiral movement. It takes the reader on a journey involving the speaker's past, present and possible future, ending with the lines almost identical to those with which it began. As for the poem's location, the speaker finds himself on a seashore with fog, grey rocks, the scent of pine trees and islands visible close at hand. In reference to this setting and to the title of the poem, it was my friend and colleague Francesca Knox who directed my attention to a connection with the first canto of Dante's Purgatorio. Here Dante and Virgil have left hell behind them, and after their conversation with Cato, they set off on foot. Dante writes, in John D. Sinclair's translation, the dawn was overcoming the morning breeze, which fled before it, so that I saw in the distance the trembling of the seashore. De lontano conobbi il tremolar della marina. Eventually, the two poets arrive at the deserted shore, where Virgil washes Dante's tear-stained cheeks with morning dew. They are still on the seashore when, in the second canto, the angel of God appears to them as a bright light, coming so swiftly over the sea that no flight could match its speed. Here then, in Dante's Purgatorio, we might see the seashore La Marina, as a place in between, a liminal place, a place of transition, where Dante, having left hell behind and having been visited by an angel, begins his journey through purgatory towards heaven. It is from this seashore that Dante and Virgil begin their ascent of the Mount of Purgatory. Eliot's Marina, then, may also be seen as marking a stage in another poet's journey towards a possible new life. In Marina too, the seashore is an in-between place. On one side, there is the land, the wasteland, the land of Eliot's own personal hell, perhaps. And on the other side, the open sea, with its intimations of the possibility of new horizons and a new life. After leaving the seashore, Dante and Virgil travel through purgatory, meeting on the way the souls of people who have practised what in Christian tradition are known as the seven deadly sins. Pride, envy, wrath, sloth, avarice, gluttony and lust. In Eliot's Marina, a sequence of lines in a form resembling an incantation also presents images of such people. Those who sharpen the tooth of the dog, meaning death. Those who, glo gl those who glitter with the glory of the hummingbird, meaning death. Those who sit in the sty of contentment, meaning death. Those who suffer the ecstasy of the animals, meaning death. These images suggest to me 
some of the characters who inhabit er Eliot's early poetry and the wasteland, Ape Neck Sweeney and his associates, the Hollow Men, Burbank and Bleistein, and Mr. Eumen Mr. Eugenides, the woman described in a game of chess, and the young man carbuncular who has casual sex with the typist. To the speaker in Marina, these examples of human weakness and depravity, imagined here in all, the, in all their corporeality and sensuality, are become insubstantial, reduced by a wind, a breath of pine, and the woodsong fog, by this grace dissolved in place. The grace of this seashore, then, is the grace of purgatory. It's often forgotten, not least by us Catholics, that purgatory implies not only punishment, but also grace and absolution and freedom from sin. All those in purgatory are irreversibly destined and on their way to the blessedness of heaven. If we think of purgatory as a place, as Dante did, it is indeed a place of punishment, but also a place where the sins of the world and their burdens of guilt are taken away by the freely given grace of God. I'd like to suggest, therefore, that the answer to the questions, what seas, what shores, is that this seashore, in Eliot's poem, is a place of grace and the lifting of the burden of sin and guilt. Lyndall Gordon suggests that Eliot's first confession in March 1928, two years before he wrote Marina, made a greater impression on him than his baptism the previous year. In a letter to his friend William Forstead, Eliot said his confession left him with an extraordinary sense of surrender and gain. At the beginning of the second part of the poem, the speaker asks questions about this face, with images that suggest uncertainty, paradox and mystery. What is this face, less clear and clearer? The pulse in the arm, less strong and stronger? Given or lent? More distant than the stars and nearer than the eye? In response to the question, his mind goes on another journey, moving between images of his boat, symbol of his old life, and memories of his own past. Bowsprit cracked with ice and paint cracked with heat. I made this, I have forgotten and remember, the rigging weak and the canvas rotten. Before he returns to the image, with which he started. This form, this face, this life, living to live in a world of time beyond me. This suggests after the grace of absolution offered at the end of the first part of the poem, a glimpse of the possibility of a new life, very different from the old. The speaker's response to this intimation is a self-offering, a prayer of self-surrender. Let me resign my life for this life, my speech for that unspoken, the awakened, lips parted, the hope, the new ships. My sense of Eliot as a person is that he was by upbringing, ancestry, background and temperament, inclined to set great store by high standards of conduct in morals and asceticism and self-discipline in religious life, even if he did not or could not always live up to those ideals. Achieving counted for a lot. This is consistent with his early interest in saints, martyrs, mystics and ascetics, and with the contempt and disgust he sometimes showed towards moral squalor and degradation, the horror, in his own life and in the world around him. 
In this kind of perspective on Christianity, one's own efforts in prayer and ascetical practice are what counts. Sin has to be atoned for and grace has to be earned. I suggest that the poem Marina represents an awakening to the possibility of a new life. In the middle of the poem, there is a recognition that this seashore is a place of grace, freely offered. In the final paragraph, the speaker is offered hope for a different life, the possibility of living to live in a world of time beyond me, represented in the vision of this form, this face. This new life is presented not as the result of effort and ascetical practice, not something of which one can say, I made this, but as unmerited, unearned gift of grace and a source of hope and wonder, the parted lips. Answering the call to this new life involves not just a decentering of the ego and acceptance of the gift, but a surrender, a self-giving in love of a whole life. So the speaker in Marina prays, let me resign my life for this life, my speech for that unspoken, the awakened, lips parted, the hope, the new ships. The poem ends where it began, with the description in almost identical terms of the location in which the speaker wakes up. In the opening paragraph, the wood thrush is singing through the fog. At the end of the poem, the wood thrush is calling through the fog. Is a difference significant? In the first paragraph, the location seems to be no more than a landscape. The bird's song, a thing of beauty and mystery. In the middle of the poem, the location is revealed as a place of divine grace and mercy. In the final paragraph, the bird's song as a divine call to the speaker, inviting a response of the gift of himself in love. I'm going to end with a couple of questions. I have concentrated on a personal and religious aspect of Eliot's life. Are there connections between Marina and Eliot's life and development as a poet? And secondly, scholars and critics have highlighted connections between Marina and Shakespeare's Pericles. Are there also connections between Marina and other father-daughter relationships in Shakespeare's plays? or Shakespeare's life and relationship with his own daughters. <laughs>